talking. I don't think uh, either of us have ever done a panel or conference on a football field before. So this is a first. <laughs> definitely a first for me. Yeah, definitely not the first of FinTech though. Both of us have been in this space for a while. Um, and as all of you know, this is a very, um, it's a very encompassing space. Sometimes real estate's in it, sometimes insurance in it. So there's a lot to cover in my role and even just focusing on wealth management, there's a lot for you to stay up to speed on. Um, and I'm not as familiar with Aladdin as what I should be and others in the audience might not be as well. So how about we just start off with like what exactly it is within BlackRock, which is a massive company and just how that has changed since you guys started this. Right, so as you said, FinTech's a pretty broad field. We started with payments this morning, and what BlackRock does is reasonably focused in the context of fin FinTech. So as you all know, BlackRock is an asset manager, uh, founded in 1988, and really with the premise that asset management or investing is about information processing. So from the very beginning, the firm had a, its own sort of FinTech platform for itself uh, called Aladdin. That's now an institutional business that has about 200 clients of institutional money managers around the world. Uh, it's about 800 million in revenue. And it's the platform that BlackRock, of course, uses itself. But three years ago, we started bringing the core of Aladdin, which is risk management and portfolio construction, to wealth management. So that as technology is transforming the way that all of us manage our financial lives, that we could bring that sort of institutional, industrial grade capability to individuals who are trying to plan for retirement, trying to save to send their kids to college. So that's Aladdin Wealth. That's what I do every day. And it's been a lot of fun over the past three years. What type of individual is your guys's like bread and butter? Is it someone that's more of a mass influent, uh, mass affluent? Is it someone that's uh, you know a wealthier person? Is it something in between? Is it both? It's really both. So our clients are, we are B2B. So our clients are our wealth management partners, banks, uh, RA registered independent advisors, so independent financial advisors around the US and increasingly in Europe uh, and a little bit in Latin America. Uh, and then our clients really do serve a range, right? So we have a product that uh, serves higher net worth individuals who want easier digital access to alternative investment management. It's called iCapital, where they're a partner of ours. Uh, and then we also have uh, robo advice through Future Advisor, so digital advice, automated, algorithmic. Uh, portfolio management for mass affluent, where the account size is ten thousand dollars, and you have you know young people saving for um, any number for their vacation. So it's really a range. Got it. And how did you guys go about developing the the new technology that you use for a bunch of these different products within a massive organization, which we always constantly hear like the bigger you get, the slower you move. There's a lot of regulation that we all know about in fintech. So how did how was that managed? And how do you make sure that it doesn't get siloed today where you can continue to have the latest and greatest thing for the advisors and clients that are using you? We've spent a lot of time trying to deconstruct what's gone right, particularly in Aladdin Wealth, which has grown really rapidly over the past three years. And I think it probably comes down to the people you have involved, a mix of people who know enough about the sort of differentiated capabilities that you have as a, within a big company or within an established platform, and then a mix of people who can apply fresh thinking. So um, we, we, didn't, we don't have any sort of formal incubator, but obviously, like many companies, innovation is one of our core principles. And so we start really with what our clients needed. We heard more and more of our wealth clients were in anticipating the fiduciary rule. Uh, we're anticipating a shift to needing to think about the outcome for their customer, that they needed to be able to say, here's the risk in your total portfolio, here's how much you can spend in retirement and not just sell you an investment product. And so it, it occurred to us that that was an opportunity and that was an opportunity to build a whole new software business. So we then identified people who had who knew the best of what we'd done with Aladdin for institutions uh, and have hired a couple hundred people in the past few years since then who have a mix of consumer technology and financial technology uh, experience. So I think it, it really depends so much on the specific people and then the how focused you are on the client problem and the user problem that you're that you're trying to solve. We of course also have partnered with other fintech startups and have invested in fintech startups, but um, really in a very focused way where we know we have a specific thing that we're trying to accomplish, not mm -hmm. just a company whose growth we may be excited about. 
Got it. Now, on the previous panel, they were talking about how we don't care if Amazon knows, like, if we're ordering toothbrushes or toothpaste, but we do care more if they know about, like, our financial well-being and whatnot. How do you manage continuing to implement that technology and make sure that the customers are okay with what the technology is and feel like they're getting enough of a value add that they're willing to continue sharing that information with you? That is a question for any and all industries, I think, right now. Anyone who's using technology to engage with people. You have to think really hard about how, what level of data is important for you to deliver a personalized experience. We all expect convenience, but we also expect transparency and who and what we trust is sort of, um, it's, it's not intuitive anymore. You may trust Uber as much as to put you in a car with a stranger um, as you do someone that has been approved by a regulator or a company or a product has been approved by a regulator. So what, we, what we've done is try to be proactive. And so we have a data promise to financial advisors that is front and center of any of, in, in any of all of our product experiences, which says we never sell your data. We never use your client data, your end investor, consumer client data, and that all the information you share with us is to personalize your experience. So we've just tried to be very transparent. But candidly, I think that this could be an opportunity, frankly, for financial services technology providers. As you think about what the burden of, of proof, if you will, and the expectation already on financial services companies to be clear about what data you collect, uh, to be audited, to be subject to regulatory exams. If you can, we already should have pretty high organizational hygiene around data and security. And so that really should give an advantage um, relative to those who are trying to achieve some kind of regulatory arbitrage in what they do with data. Right. Now, continuing on the tech theme, where, where do you see like the most room to enhance financial well-being and whatnot through tech? Because we keep hearing about things like Social Security isn't going to be available in a while. A lot of people don't have pension plans, which was their big retirement uh, savings beforehand. How can BlackRock and others in the industry leverage technology to help save what could be a massive problem? I think the first step is just demystifying what it is that we do. Uh, that's certainly the case in investing. It's the case in other areas of fintech and financial services, too. So we try to use as little jargon as possible. I've already been pretty guilty of it probably this morning. Um, but the first step is, you know, an invest, investor alone as a word is kind of alienating to a lot of people. What does it mean to be an investor? Everyone needs to be saving. Everyone needs to be thinking about what they want to accomplish in their life and how their money can help them do that. And as you said, if we're living longer and we don't have to find benefit programs or they're shrinking, uh, then the burden is on individuals to make the right choices. So uh, we are constantly thinking about how we can through education, through humanizing the language of investing, and then frankly through products like uh, we've invested in Acorns, a company that allows you to uh, save your spare change and it builds up and you end up with a small portfolio over time, how you can help people uh, engage in the right behaviors. But it's a, it's a critical, critical problem for, uh, for governments, for companies, and it's frankly one that I think is really exciting to be part of. And that's why I think we, we see ourselves attracting talent and people who are excited about tackling that problem because mm -hmm. it is, it's not just a, it's a multi-generational challenge of how you make the economy work for people. Right. Uh, and you mentioned partnerships earlier as well in terms of like not just the startups, but larger tech companies, finance companies, and others. Who are some that are leveraging your technology for retirement plans or anything like that? I think Microsoft is one of them, and then there's others that are out there too. Right. So we've just announced a partnership with Microsoft. We haven't launched that yet. Uh, we haven't launched the, the product yet. So we... Most of our technology is used by, as I said, banks and, and wealth managers um, across, across the U.S., Mexico, and, and Europe. We have announced that partnership with Microsoft where we intend to address the problem you just asked about, which is how do you help people think uh, in a more personalized, uh, approachable way about their own retirement? So, for example, can you create an investment product and a technology experience or a digital delivery of that product that allows people to think of getting a paycheck for life uh, or how to think about their retirement income uh, where you can really bridge the gap between all these investments you have to choose in the sort of first few decades of your lives that will lead to income in the future at a, at a time when we don't even know when we're going to retire, when 65 mm -hmm. isn't really a realistic age for many people anymore. So that's what, we, that's what we're working on with Microsoft. And then we do, have a, we do have something called iRetire in the market today that allows people to say how much they want to spend in retirement and then figure out how they want to invest. 
Right. So where do you see Aladdin in five to 10 years? Is it still, I mean, I would assume there's different product launches that are out there. Maybe there's new technologies that are, you are leveraging. How should we think about the future of your portion of BlackRock? Well, it will be much bigger. <laughs> That's an easy answer. Um, I think it'll be, it'll be global. It'll be reaching that many more people. It'll be reaching, I think, uh, more individuals still through B2B to C. Um, but that the core principle of how you can think about risk, how you can translate actions today into a future that you want, uh, has huge potential. And so what we're trying to do and have been doing so far is bringing that technology to people where they are. So it doesn't mean that you'll be downloading an Aladdin app on your phone, but it means that whatever you go to today to make your financial decisions, particularly around investing, uh, we hope will we'll be part of it, that we hope that we'll be powering part of it. Now, this might not end up being Aladdin, but do you ever see a world where we would have a 401k or something else managed by someone like Amazon or Apple? I just ask since obviously Apple's working with Goldman on a credit card, and it seems like tech and finance are continually merging close together, and I don't know what you see in terms of those large tech companies playing in this. There's no question that large technology platforms are experimenting with and looking to get into financial services broadly. Uh, they're starting with either payments or they're starting with now credit cards, a little bit in savings uh, and, and sort of deposits. Um, not so much in investing yet. So absolutely, we will see any company that is fighting for our mind share also fight for our mind share with respect to our wallets. And so what, what, whether they want to then become an asset manager, which is pretty regulated, somewhat specialized, I think is really an open question. So even though some of the barriers to entry in managing money are shrinking, they're still, they're still nevertheless there. And you can create uh, really strong fintech businesses without touching every single part of a person's financial life. So mm -hmm. our view is that there isn't necessarily a winner-take-all market in your financial life and that there's a lot of opportunity to work with those companies. Got it. And now, since it is such a large market, how do you think being B to B to C has helped you versus being B to C? Because consumers are very, they're tough to reach. There's a lot of players out there for me to choose from in terms of like who I want to manage my money. I could rattle off 10 off the top of my head very easily. How do you think, you know, going to businesses and advisors instead has helped you guys grow more quickly? Well, first of all, those are our clients today. Mm -hmm. So those are, for BlackRock, those are clients with whom we already have a trusted relationship. And so we could start from a place of saying, look, you know that you want to and need to transform your business as technology is changing everyone's expectations uh, for convenience and for how we li live our lives. So that allowed us to, I think, grow, grow quickly because we already had that distribution adv advantage and channel. Um, but to your point around what does it mean to be B2B to C or direct to consumer, uh, the previous conversation, they were talking a lot about the competition among direct to consumer fintech startups. And it's all about distribution. It's all about acquiring customers. Uh, and that's ultimately what ends up being so expensive, particularly as we're seeing pieces of financial services become available as a service, thinking as a service or debit cards as a service. Uh, so, you know, it, it, best of luck to all the direct-to-consumer fintech startups. There's a lot of opportunity, and I'm sure many of them have been already and will continue to be very successful. But for us, as an, an originally institutional asset manager and now serving a lot of wealth management clients, our objective has always been to, to serve our clients and help them transform. Got it. So how do you think someone like me, part of the mass affluent, is managing my money in 10 years? Well, what do you do today? Today, I, I test out a lot of the different robo-advisors since I cover this space. So I'm not a typical millennial. That's just because it's, like, it's part of my job. But essentially, like, there's, like, you use the 401k at work, and then there's a little bit elsewhere. There's like Marcus High Yield Savings. But like, is there a platform I'll be able to go to in the future that can just do all of that for me? And I have a very trusted relationship with that. I think that there'll be several platforms that can do all of that for you, and it doesn't mean that they'll be doing all of those services themselves. So, for example, 401k is, for most Americans, their only investment account. Mm -hmm. And so anchoring things around your 401k is, could be really powerful. Many people just forget about it entirely, but if you can start there and have people save more in their 401k, and then if those providers can integrate, uh, we're seeing now a race for, because of the uh, advent and uh, adoption of APIs and financial services, we're seeing a race for everybody to integrate great. So absolutely, I think that you see all these, even the direct-to-consumer startups are adding more services horizontally. The robo-advisors are adding debit cards, they're adding savings. Um, 
some of the lending startups are adding investing. So there's a recognition that you want to go to one place. Um, so yeah, I think that is, it's very, very likely, but it may not be that the company, the, the brand on the app or the company where you walk into a branch to the extent people continue to do that mm -hmm. is doing all the services. Got it. So you talked a lot about expanding and backstage you're talking about how you guys recently opened up an office here. It's still a pretty small team, but it sounds like you want to grow that quite rapidly. So why did you choose Atlanta to open that office and like what kind of people are you guys going to have located here? So I'm from South Carolina, so I'm very excited that we have an office in the South now. Uh, we chose Atlanta for several reasons. Obviously, it's an awesome city, uh, but also great, great pool of talent and history in fintech, starting with payments. Uh, but as our fintech business grows really quickly. It was important to us to, uh, to be in a place where you have some recognition in the community of the potential of growth in this industry. And you're right, we, we, uh, we started hiring uh, earlier this spring and uh, we'll be here um, for, you know, for a while ramping up. What type of people are you going to be having here? Is it going to be mostly like tech focused, finance focused, a mix, advertising? There's a lot of people that go into what makes Aladdin Aladdin. It's a mix, and it's not just Aladdin. It's all of BlackRock's business. So we have we actually have some investors who are here. We have some client management, uh, people operations, and the Aladdin business. Okay, got it. Uh, so where do you see fintech broadly in 10 years? Is it still called fintech? Like, are we still talking about it like this? Is it just like such a, a merge and a thing that it's not really broken out between finance and technology? Like, what, what am I going to be talking about if I'm back on this stage in 10 years? I think that's a good question. Like, you know, will we say fintech? Will people say retail tech? Will we have all these sort of like um, abbreviated terms with tech? Or is in, in 10 years, will tech just be part of every industry? I think the latter. I think tech will just be part of every industry and that those companies that can adopt it and that can uh, evolve the way that they serve their customers will be around and those that can't may not. Got it. And you have partially a legal background as well, right? I am a non-practicing lawyer, yes. So how do you see regulation playing into, into this industry in the future if tech wants to continue getting more into it when we have people like Elizabeth Warren already saying that tech is too big? Well, again, I think the fact that, so, t well, FinTech is not new, right? Technology has driven financial services for decades, whether in trading uh, mm -hmm. or uh, on the sell side and the like. Or like a Bloomberg terminal. Or like a Bloomberg <laughs> terminal. Um, so tech and financial services isn't new, but this current sort of rapid adoption of consumer use of technology and financial services is, is obviously a little bit behind what we've seen in communications or the media. And that's an advantage, as I mentioned. So I think it's an advantage for fintech companies, small or big, uh, to look ahead to see how the regulation and the sort of anticipation of uh, government response to the big tech platforms is, is evolving and get ahead of it. So I don't think it's going to slow growth of fintech companies, um, again, incumbent or sort of upstart. Uh, and that, again, it can really be an advantage for companies that can at the outset say, look, we have, we're FINRA approved or we have a really, we, you know, been through SEC exams or we know what it takes uh, mm -hmm. so that you don't have issues like some of... Um, some startups who will go unnamed have struggles with in the past year. And it doesn't mean that they're going out of business, but it, it, put, it certainly requires them to pause and invest in uh, hiring a lot of lawyers. Right, right. And smart lawyers that are going to tell you not to just move fast and break things and actually pay attention to what the regulators want you to do. But who can also be creative because mm -hmm. so many of both reg regulations, uh, legislation, and then also guidance is really for a different era. If you think mm -hmm. about even mutual fund disclosures, they're not, uh, they're not intuitive, they're not uh, digestible, and so there's really a need for creative people who are comfortable with law to figure out how, how we sort of can evolve that framework to deliver what people, what people need. Okay. Got it. Perfect. We are out of time, so I will let the MC come back on stage. Thank you so much, and thank, thank you guys. You. Thank you all.